There will there are two options which we mentioned. One is with MS segment and one with Sioni ring. And then I, I will go to two difficult situations. Uh, can you play the video, please? Yeah. So this is, uh, uh, as you can see, almost 180 degree or more subluxation is there. And w the most important step in this is the posterior uh, the, is the anterior capsular excess. More more often than not, uh, you may tend to make, if you are trying to make a larger axis, you may extend it towards the periphery. So initially, initial aim should be towards a smaller size axis so that we have enough rim to support the uh, uh, capsular supporting segments or uh, Sioni ring. And in this case, if, if you have noticed, this is suboptimal anterior capsular opening, but still we went ahead with CTR implantation and then aspiration of the lens matter and IOL implantation. After IOL implantation, now you can see the visual axis has the capsule over it. It is, uh, and which over a period of time will opacify. So we made a relaxing cut in the anterior capsule and try to enlarge the rexis to a respectable size. So these are small modifications which will always be there in case to case basis. These are not like adult cataracts where we can operate at subcortical level. We have to keep thinking and uh, find solution on the table itself. And with the MH segment now in place, uh, it is, and if Dr. Susan Jacobs uh, innovation goes through, then all this will become obsolete. That is a very easy way to handle uh, subluxated lenses. And it is finally sutured to the sclera. And one, uh, one issue is whether we should use 10-0 proline or 9-0 proline. 9-0 proline will be preferable because these sutures will hold on for a very long time and 9-0 has less tendency to erode through the uh, tissue and chances of complication later on will be less. Second option is with Sioni ring. Play. Mouse is not working. So in this, uh, this is the second uh, way it, it, which it can be done. The, after the initial capsular excess, As you can see in this, the Sioni ring is implanted. One, one important thing here is that uh, the opening has to be a decent opening so that we are able to insert a large Sioni ring through it. Because once it slips out of the bag, it becomes very difficult to reinsert it again. And also the main incision, slight one millimeter extension sometimes we may require to give for the eyelet to go inside. And once the ring is in place, we rotate it towards the subluxated site and uh, um, the scleral opening and suture it to the sclera. And it can be done in two ways. One is the, what we are seeing here is before cortical aspiration. It can also be done after cortical aspiration, depending on the com comfort level of the surgeon. And finally, rotate the ring so that it gets aligned with the uh, area in which you are uh, putting the sutures, the suture knot. And titration of the knot is also important. We should be aware that over a period of time, it may be slight, uh, it may become loose. So slight uh, tight uh, on the tighter side is more preferable. And if you can see it came from the other side, it is, uh, uh, we can see the subluxated area, which later on, if it progresses to the other side, it can be dealt it in the second setting. So these are the two uh, methods. And now when you get into troubles, so this is one in which I got into trouble. And in this, we had planned a Sioni uh, ring and uh, Initial steps went on well, but again, as I said earlier, if your size of rexis is uh, not uh, good enough, then we may land up in trouble. And here, before finishing the rexis, we put the capsular hooks and completed it. 
and here that modification is that we did the cortical aspiration first and when we started implanting the Sioni ring if you can see from if you can follow this portion this portion they started coming out of the bag and we didn't I didn't notice it so when we pu I pushed the ring inside at the same time it was coming out of the bag and now we have a situation in which the ring is in the uh, anterior chamber but not in the bag so this becomes very difficult and required a lot of manipulation almost 15 20 minutes I, I had been manipulating this and by the time I had thought of abandoning it removing it all I tried rotating it to the opposite side and when I rotated it to the opposite side with with good posterior push to my uh, because of my luck and luck of the patient it went inside the bag so this is some of the situations which we will face and then after that the procedure is same now the next case this is another uh, complication which uh, I faced uh, during the procedure <coughs> the capsular excess went off well and the even the Sioni ring insertion went off smoothly once this is done one this is done I'll just push through it when we were aspirating the cortex we found that the uh, the eyelet of the ring was within the bag and I didn't notice that and while pulling the suture it cut through the anterior capsular margin because the suture is again sharp and if the eyelet is inside that will cause extraction on the anterior capsular margin and we got a gap here we got that uh, uh, extended to the posterior capsule and we got a posterior capsule rent through the zonules so again the ring was placed the bag was fixed but in this case a three piece IUL was placed in the sulcus and luckily for me the bag was uh, the, uh, this was well centered at the end of surgery and is still maintaining but these are not the ideal way it has to be done it is a damage control we did in this case thank you so much thank you Dr. Love for showing all those uh, beautiful videos just a moment because you have been doing the pediatric eyeballs you have done a long follow-up all these cases I mean children might have grown at least yeah, five six almost, years uh, now uh, see what my observation has been the play with the patients whom I had done 10 years 15 years back with 270 degree or around uh, more than 180 degree if I've given them a single eyelet C or mm -hmm. a single eyelet they have come back after four or five years with a lot of fibrosis a lot of you know the the pressure has been uh, until and those patients I've given both side either two CTS or two uh, or a double Sioni which we tend not to use it because it's very you know, maneuvering as well so what do you what do you think the longer because today see for last two years I prefer for 270 plus just do a lensectomy and put a uh, interscleral one, IOL or one way what I had faced in one of the cases in which the other side had given way I just used one uh, tenoproline suture through the bag and tied it to and the sclera again. and then it got sent de uh, re recentered till now that is the only case of seven eight year follow-up which uh, I have faced uh, which in, has in, uh, such I, mean a I have faced but again quite double C on me is very I mean, very difficult to very maneuver it. and putting mm -hmm. two CTS is also quite time consuming especially if you are doing and you do not have a gap in the zonules that side so again when you are pushing through the sclera there are chances of uh, perforating the bag if it is if you are using double again either mm. it, it cannot be 180 degree apart it can be to Wh either what does the international studies say of all these especially those marfans or yeah, they are not above much publications not unfortunately much publication. they are not because the via surgeon science uh, mm. as I gather most of them would prefer a vitrectomy a lensectomy and putting a Rural as against less than 180 degree. I think that's. Uh, let's have Dr. Parthobiswas uh, with a little bit of comment on that about those. Uh, he has been doing in all these 270 plus subluxation for quite some time, and the follow up before he comes to the disaster. Uh, and he has to leave, and the, so his topic has come before <laughs> us. Anyway, fine. Thank you very much, uh, Ajay, for giving me an opportunity to be here in this wonderful course and all masters not only on the dais but off the dais also I see so many masters there can uh, but you know there are certain 
uh, times that we need to think about the basics also. Can I just have a quick raise of hands of people who are not using, uh, who are using CTR and devices uh, for subluxated, who are using? Fine, that's absolutely, oh, Arup Bhomik is not using, so please remember, that, okay, fine Arup, thank you. So, uh, so we will dwell upon a few situations where we are going to talk about basics and then of course the advanced techniques have already been shown, I'll also be showing you a few of them. So etiology, we know all these congenital etiologies and acquired etiologies, all these conditions in which we may have the subluxated lenses and these cataracts deserve special attention and special aspects to deal with them so that we get a good outcome. And the systemic disorders are there. Why I highlight this slide is because we need to care not only for the eyes, but we need to refer them to the respective uh, systemic pathologies and so that they get a full treatment. Pre-operative evaluation, what Ajay just mentioned, the lens position is very important. Phacodonesis during your slit lamp examination or the amount of cataract and the zonule loss has to be ascertained as much as possible so that you can plan the surgery before you actually go into it. And you must uh, spend time and see whether there is vitreous in the anterior chamber. Because if it is there, that has to be dealt hand in hand with your phacoemulsification whenever you're going in. And if there is an inferior subluxation, then there could be a very large amount of uh, subluxation and you might not be able to assess it because the effect of gravity is also there. So let's start with uh, all uh, these uh, few uh, videos that we have. And uh, this one is, uh, when do you put a CTR is the question. The dictum is CTR placed as later as you can, but as early as it deserves. So if you have to put a CTR right in the beginning, then put it right in the beginning. The other aspects can be dealt with, especially the cortex being being trapped between the CTR and the capsule. But the CTR is a great device and you, can, you should put in as quickly as possible. The other uh, aspect is the rexis is one of the most important aspects of doing uh, the cataract surgery in the subluxated lens. You can see that we have placed the CTR in the bag and it has gone in very smoothly. And I'm going to show you a few instances when it does not go very smoothly at all. So we'll change the video and go on to another uh, video in which uh, what you are going to see is CTR at times can really give trouble, though it seems so easy and especially when the masters do it, it seems so easy, so it can give trouble. But before that, let me dwell a little more upon the capsular excess that is being done. Again, your triumph depends upon if you have done a good capsular excess and you must have at least a four millimeter clear of the subluxated area, center the capsular excess on the lens, on the subluxated lens and definitely not on the pupil so that you have a very good rim of anterior capsule when you're putting in your lenses, your devices and everything. Now look at this. So I'm placing the CTR and what can you see? So once I'm trying to place the CTR and what has happened, the CTR has gone in through the hook and it has Travel, traveled right into the uh, the device through which I'm put in placing it. So the Sinsky hook has not worked and then it has slipped and now it has slipped into the angle of the anterior chamber. Now I make a second attempt and try to put it in and this time uh, it is another hook from the other end and I'm trying to wiggle it in and as you can see these happen with when there are large subluxated areas because these large subluxations you do not have the support of the zonules and the bag to place in all these devices and you're trying to wiggle it in. So again so it has gone in and <coughs> this time it has gone in quite well. You have to be 100% sure and especially in a very well dilated pupil that the CTR has actually gone into the bag and one end is not slipped out into the angle. So the, uh, the other parts are uh, quite uh, nothing very specific. Let's go on to the next video. And 
here in this video what we have is uh, there is vitreous in the anterior chamber which we had noted and uh, this uh, amount of uh, uh, vitreous needs to be tackled as and when required so we make a uh, capsulorexis and the making of the capsulorexis let me again dwell on this if you can make a good capsulorexis with your cystotome well and good but whenever you are having trouble with the cystotome please go ahead and take a micro forceps a micro forceps <coughs> sorry a micro forceps comes in from different manufacturers there are micro forceps which go in through a 1.2 millimeter side port they are the best and if you are trying to deal with uh, a subluxated lens you must have micro forceps and micro scissors in your armamentarium without them please do not go ahead and the micro forceps gives you a lot of uh, um, a lot of uh, benefit when you are doing it so here what you can see is you know i was uh, trying to do the phaco emulsification and i saw that there was a subluxation so the area of subluxation needs to be supported let us not go in without supporting because let us remember that the zonules are all in place and if the zonules are not supported well then what will happen uh, in the subluxated area the subluxation will increase so let us support it with uh, these hooks and devices so that we can get a good and clear way let's uh, i think time is uh, short so i'll just uh, show you uh, love showed ex excellent videos on subluxated uh, lenses the marfan syndrome i'll just show you my disaster in the first case here love uh, did not show a disaster i have to show you a disaster because these things are happenings that do happen and i was trying to do everything right and you can see that i was trying to do through a uh, uh, the micro forceps also and I'm not able to get a uh, good uh, rexis and then I tried to put in the CTR could not put in the CTR and uh, in the end had to take it out abort this procedure and uh, go in for an SFI oil in this procedure the second eye of this patient uh, where again the subluxation was quite large we go in and uh, what we do is to fill in viscoelastic high molecular viscoelastic in the area of subluxation thereby when I'm putting the tripan blue the tripan blue does not seep into the vitreous cavity which is very important otherwise you're working in a very dark night situation here again making that first nick can be tough so you need to have either a cystotome and in some cases you might have to work with an MVR because, uh, from the opposite pole like this is the subluxated area here so if nothing works then you might have to work with an MVR coming in from this so that at least you are able to make a nick at times the nick is very important difficult to make but uh, it can be done can I take a one or two more minutes okay so then uh, this one of course is a little bit of a triumph of a case of course you have to support the rexis with the uh, ball tip dialer and once you support it then you are able to get through with the capsular rexis and it has to be a gentle procedure please take time please refill with viscoelastic and you can actually get a good capsular rexis once a good capsular rexis is done in such a uh, difficult uh, marfans you, most of the work is actually done so in this case we are putting in the iris hooks the iris hooks also supported very well again placing uh, the uh, the CTR inside the bag is very important love also showed the importance of placing it and if it has gone out see how he, well he could tackle it and please also remember that the zonules whatever they are do help so nothing is lost and you need to try it's only when you have really damaged or the damage has taken place that you go ahead and uh, about the procedure but uh, the thing is try till the last so we uh, again placing an intraocular lens in such conditions is also important here I'm placing the intraocular lens through the nasal side why through the nasal side is because the subluxation is on the temporal side so if I try from the temporal side then I'm uh, then negotiating the uh, the capsule is difficult so uh, these are uh, things and you have to do a good suturing and in case you need to do a good suturing then you go ahead and uh, see uh, the centration which uh, was uh, shown last case I will quickly show and this is a video that uh, is quite a old video I'll just show you this is a spherophakia in which uh, we did uh, uh, 
lens implantation and uh, the importance of doing the spherophakia. Again, do attempt spherophakic eyes. Do attempt. In this one, it was a specially difficult condition because the anterior capsule was adhered to the posterior, uh, posterior uh, cornea. And that adherence was separated. And uh, what we were expecting is a uh, total white cornea and everything, but really not. So we, uh, we, the cornea was well maintained. What was difficult is because of the fibrosis of the anterior capsule, capsulotomy was difficult. But again, we could get a puncture and we could do off the capsulotomy. Again, doing off the capsulotomy, you can see the ball uh, dialer helping me to do the capsulotomy. And you can see the excursion of the uh, forceps going all around. So uh, once that is done, so uh, now what happened, my disaster again here is I placed in the lens and everything went on well, and, but I did not put in the segments. And then after four months, this is what I had, a disaster. The lens capsular bag was half in the AC. So what could I do? So this uh, patient was taken up and what we did is we separated the, uh, uh, the synechia and then what we did is we sutured the capsule with the haptic of the lens. It was a single piece lens and we sutured it off. You can see that we are uh, taking off the synechia and uh, Ajay, just uh, 30 seconds, this is my last video. And uh, we are able to suture the two ends and of this uh, fibrotic bag along with the, uh, the, uh, along with the haptic in both the ends. And uh, after this is done, it usually stays well in place and uh, the other eye of the same patient we could do very well. I'm not showing that. And uh, the last photograph is what we had post-operatively. This eye, again, well-centered, but of course, not the best of uh, you know, uh, the surgical aspect. But the left eye, which we did put in the two uh, CTR in place, was doing so well and looks so pristine. Thank you very much for your patient hearing. Thank you. Uh, Partha, those excellent videos, especially the, the last case. And that was the reason I was saying that it is over a period of time, it's, it happened as early as four months. But then normally these, if you are doing more than 270, you can never predict what is the, uh, the forces that are acting. And that's it. So let's come to an, another aspect, the intraoperative and traumatic malposition of the lenses. I'll straightway go to small videos. I think, yeah, okay. So this is around 20 year old video I'm just showing, 15 year old probably. Uh, so intraoperative zonular dehiscence. As you can see that the quality of the video is not that good, but this is the capsulorexis. Those days we are hardly using any trepan blue. This is something a 99 or 2000 video. Uh, this stands as a you know, hallmark from where I changed over a lot of surgical procedures. Now this is a soft cataract. Those are the days as you are going periphery, trying to do chip and flip, going still towards periphery, and then trying to do that cartwheel technique, which early, and we tried to do it. And then when I was not getting a hold, it was very important if you have a small rexis, this would happen. So the whole, I had caught the rexis margin and gone forward. And then again, I thought I'll do it. I was not that experienced well. And then again, the whole thing, I thought that it is almost 90 degrees subluxation now. I have to do something about it. I used a uh, viscoelastic just to lollipop that uh, cortical matter out. And there, use CTR uh, injector. Those days, we had a CTR injector with us. Unfortunately, we don't have one now. And the CTR, once the CTR goes in, and so the bag is, again, the surgical procedure uh, is just like any other procedure that we have done the surgery. And then removing those days, I used to use the coaxial uh, IA. And you can see gradually get the whole thing and the surgery becomes well and they put the lens of my choice. Change, change. This is a traumatic cataract again. I'd come to this. So this is 
very difficult to maneuver it when you are not doing it with your own laptop and all. Now this is around, this is a traumatic cataract. This has got a 90 degree uh, subluxation. This is a trauma, so I am aware that I am not using any uh, uh, hooks or anything. But then it looked, the, uh, the iris looked picked. So I should have done a, uh, put in a, uh, some triumphs in order to check if the vitreous was there. But in the slit lamp, definitely I could see some strands of vitreous. So in these cases, Actually, just putting a CTR does the job, as I said, the basic principle if it is less than 90 degree. And just put in the CTR, go ahead with the uh, emulsification, and then you can feel the, I could feel the iris picking out and the, the, a lot of, you know, strands coming there. So towards the end of the surgery, just take it, take her out the, uh, the cortical matter, as you can see, just sideways, as I said, if you put the CTR in early in the procedure, it may be a bit of difficult, but if you are, if you do it quite often, you can actually manage it. I could have put the CTR at the end of the surgery in this case, but since I was aware that there is a bit of vitreous there and see, see the iris is picked up, it's very important that I remove this uh, vitreous, as I can see, swipe it with the uh, hook and there, putting in a, a actually delineates all the vitreous there and then doing a good vitrectomy. There, as you can see, once I do that vitrectomy, the whole lens could move forward and the people become round and that would end the surgery. Next, changing over is. I think this is. I think the. This is next one, yeah. This is again around uh, less than, uh, this is 260, this is just more than 180 degree, you can see. I put a Rexis marker there and do a bit vitrectomy. This is again a traumatic uh, cataract. You can see the lens is tilted. Do a vitrectomy right and there's, as, it, as was said earlier, it's very important how do you, where do you center your Rexis. As you can see, I've made the Rexis a bit away from the subluxator side so that I can get the rexis actually the lens, centering the lens as you could see and this stage it is little more than 90 degree and less than 180 degrees so putting a CTR there would center my uh, lens and the rexis and then continuing the vitrectomy and then clearing the vitreous there putting the iris hooks there to hold the capsular margin and then do with my phaco emulsification. And in these cases, normally I would lower my parameters a bit. Then I do around 450 or 500. They here bring it around 300. Do slow motion phaco, as you could say. And then doing a bit of irrigation aspiration. And then put in the lens, as you can see. And then in this case also, continuing with the vitrectomy and just this without any capsular support, without any uh, 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 scleral support, I could continue this case. And I come to the last case of this series. This was a uh, subluxation quite bigger than I was expecting. This was almost more than 180 degree. I could see the vitreous already. This is a white cataract, as it's a quite old cataract. Fibrosclerosed anterior capsule is very important to get me the right uh, puncture. And once I got the puncture, I could continue the capsular axis with the, as Dr. Biswasa was saying, it's very important that you use that because the lens is tilted. Here, if I try to go with the, from the main incision, any Uchrata forces, that would you know, every time the anterior chamber would become shallow. So here from the side port, a uh, micro forceps, as you can see, and the staining somehow was less. I tried to use a little less. And then I decide to put the CTR, as is my practice, because I would like to stabilize the lens before I go ahead with the emulsification, as I've done it. So then I realized that there are a lot of vitreous. I do a, I put a, a put a prime signal on. As I'm doing vitrectomy, you can see the whole lens is tilting, tilting. 
as more and more vitreous comes out, so it's very, uh, I just on the height side, doing a parts plan of vitrectomy in these cases would work because as you try to clear the vitreous, the whole more and more vitreous comes on because you are putting in fluid and, and then I realized I put a, a iris hook, uh, the iris hooks there to hold the, uh, the rexis margin and then continue with the biomanual eye as you can see the tangential movement if, uh, if you put the CTR before removing the cortical cleanup but in these cases as was stated by the part so put it as and when it is required and this case see a tangential sideway movement can actually get you out the cortical matter and then once that is done in this case since it is more than 180 I just put in the lens of choice in this patient because I prefer to use a bigger haptic with a bigger longer haptic and then use a supporting device in this case a CT segment to support it I normally don't take out a flap I just do a scleral uh, small incision and through that normally I take out my the railroad technique as you have seen uh, in earlier cases the same way put in it's very important when you put this needle so that you don't catch the cornea this is some small tips that you just put a maybe a spatula just to make that space so that the needle goes in and maneuver it in the second when you are trying to put the second uh, needle it might happen that whole thing might come out the and then again maneuver it, take it out from the other side and then center it gradually. This centering it was important. Though, though it was a traumatic cataract, it is not a progressive one, but in these sort of cases where it's more than 80 or just touching around 80s, you do it and then get it towards periphery and then maybe do a bit of residual vitrectomy and that would end your case. Thank you. With this, I come to the end. And I think uh, we'll have uh, Dr. Priya. I think you wanted to speak before. Or, yeah, let us speak. Yeah. Dr. Priya? Any comments anybody would like to say? Dr. Basti is here, uh, one of the most pro prolific. He's all the way from states. He's here. To, he'll be presenting us. Uh, he'll be a keynote addressee in our case. I think he would comment on it as he gives his lecture the last. Yes, Priya. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, at the outset, I would like to thank Dr. Ajay Paul for inviting me to his wonderful instruction course. Thank you so much. Uh, well, I'll start with my topic about IL choices in ectopia lentis. I think a lot has been discussed about this, so I'll be just covering up uh, some of the portions that uh, I'll be showing you. Uh, it may be a partial or a total uh, displacement or a malposition of the crystalline lens. Uh, the subluxation, it may be again either a progressive or a non-progressive uh, zonulopathy. So the management depends quite upon the type of zonulopathy that is present. Uh, the degree of subluxation also uh, should be taken into account because for minimal subluxations you can just do with a simple CTR but when you have a massive subluxations coming up and that too if it's a progressive kind, your line of management changes totally. Uh, the choice of IOL, uh, what I would like to say is that I've seen some of the surgeons putting one piece IOL into the capsular bag by stabilizing it by various uh, uh, devices and some of the surgeons, they prefer using a three-piece intraocular lens. So, uh, but in my personal choice, I always try to use a three-piece foldable intraocular lens. The concept being that uh, in the post-op period, if I encounter any uh, uh, subluxation or decentration of the capsular bag, I can have a closed chamber approach and convert it into a glued out secondary fixation procedure. So now this is one of the cases where there was a wandering lens. I mean, this, it's a sphere of echia, it's a wandering lens. When the patient sits, it's in the anterior chamber. When the patient sleeps, it goes into the posterior cavity. So for these simple cases, I would just go in with a lensectomy, vitrectomy, and with a secondary oil fixation procedure. There are various procedures of secondary oil fixation that, that you can choose and recently uh, the glued procedure is definitely, it, uh, it has a lot of momentum, but Yamane uh, technique is also picking up quite well. So for uh, simple cases of uh, non-progressive zonulopathy, I would just, I, I think most of the things have been discussed and I'm not going to discuss all those things. I'll come up to the point that what I try to do uh, in some of the cases is that this is one of the techniques which I, we call it as a vitrectomy assisted phaco emulsification procedure which got published in the Journal of Cataract and Refractive Surgery 2016. Now this is the video. So... I think you, you just have a look at this. This is 
uh, 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 that there is also an associated iris coloboma, so I just start uh, beginning with the capsulorexis procedure uh, as it is done usually in these cases. So what happens basically in these cases, wherever you have a lenticular def uh, defect or a deficit, uh, when you start doing a phacoemulsification, you always have an anterior and a posterior chamber communication. This is the area of communication. When you are doing a phacoemulsification procedure, uh, the amount of fluid which you need to maintain into the anterior chamber, some amount of fluid also goes behind into the vitreous cavity, and often the surgeons, they feel the pressure coming up with the bulging into the anterior segment. So what we try to do if you encounter this situation, what we try to do in these cases is that during the procedure of echoemulsification, once you begin, we place a volvular trocar cannula at a distance of three millimeter as we do you usually. And um, through this uh, trocar, if the pressure rises into the anterior chamber, we try to do a limited vitrectomy. So this pulls down the pressure into the anterior chamber, makes it deep, and it facilitates the phacoemulsification procedure. And this is done intermittently. Plus, you have to be smart enough to place the trocar cannula in a position where you are actually seeing. Because you are doing a vitrectomy, you do not want to cut down the posterior capsule with your vitrectomy probe. So you should be actually seeing the vitrectomy cutter when you are doing the vitrectomy in these cases. Because when you are trying to cut this down, as I said earlier, it should not damage the lenticular capsule. So uh, once, once or twice, uh, it often suffices well during the surgical procedure. And um, you can just go ahead with the uh, doing a normal uh, procedure as we all do. So we call this procedure as a vitrectomy assisted phacoemulsification. In this case, there is a, we need to support the uh, zonules here also. So we're trying to put a capsular uh, tension ring in this patient once it is implanted. Uh, we just go ahead and do an irrigation aspiration. You have to be very careful while uh, placing the, the CTR. I like to place it somewhere around the uh, middle of the surgery because I, I do get some amount of space and I try uh, avoiding any further stress on the zonules or anything of that sort. So once you have done this, you have to go ahead, clean up the cortical matter, and uh, then obviously in this case there was, uh, see now this is what I want to emphasize. This is a three-piece intraocular lens. I try to place a three-piece intraocular lens with a haptic especially across the uh, area where the subluxation is maximum because these haptics are a bit stronger compared. But I think now we have very good one-piece IOs also which surgeons are putting. So but I try to align the haptics in a way that the three-piece haptics, they will uh, put an additional pressure on the lenticular thing. Now this is the pupiloplastic procedure. We need to reconstruct the pupil also. So this was just a modified MAC channel, but these days we do uh, a single pass through pupiloplastic procedure. So this was one of the case uh, which looks on the good on the post-op. Okay, sorry. Okay, this is another case now which I'm trying to show. This is a massive subluxation. Uh, in this case, actually, I do not struggle doing capsulotomies. I've seen many people that have some shown such beautiful videos and such beautiful results. Maybe I'm not that good. It doesn't suit into my hands. I try to go ahead and do a lensectomy with vitrectomy <laughs> clear cut in these cases. Uh, after, because I have noticed that in my hands, when I try to do, this gives me the most optimal result, because uh, maybe one of the reason is that I do lots of uh, glued out secondary fixation procedures and handle lots of complicated cases, that's why. Now these, this is, I want to emphasize one step that we try to do in the glued out procedure, is the peripheral iridectomy. We try to do this with a vitrectomy, and this was my paper again that got published into JCRS. This is a peripheral iridectomy done with a vitrectomy probe. The concept being that, you know, this is a bigger eye. So we try to do a bit of anterior sclerotomy at a distance of 0.5 or 1 millimeter. So now you see how beautifully this needle goes in and come out in the sclerotomy as a sclerotomy opening, and it does not damage the iris tissue here. Otherwise, it will drag the iris tissue and cause iridodialysis on the table. So this is one of the procedure that we have adopted to overcome some of the limitations of uh, the clinical scenario at that point of time. And we go ahead with doing a uh, lensectomy. In these cases, I've done quite a bit now, even in young cases and adults. So this gives very good results. Once you have cleared up with the entire lenticular matter, uh, then it's a simple thing. You do a very good amount of vitrectomy. You clear up all the vitreous into the anterior chamber and into the pupillary zone, and then you just go ahead with a three-piece intraocular lens. Now, this was one of the reasons that I always try to put a three-piece IOL in subluxations, because uh, I can uh, convert those cases. I just simply have to externalize those haptics in case if my back gets dislocated. So this is a three-piece IOL going in. The tip of the haptic has been caught. Just a two minutes. 
tip of the haptic has been caught and this is a slow unfolding of the intraocular lens that is going on. Once the entire IOL has unfolded, only then pull the tip of the haptic. And once the leading haptic has been externalized, we again grasp the trailing haptic, go in, flex it. Now this is a no assistant technique, again my technique. You can see the leading haptic is lying out, it does not slip back. This again got published into JCRS, I think it was 2015 or so in Jan issue. So uh, once you have externalized both these haptics, the next thing is that you just always close the corneal incision whenever there is a vitreous. Uh, any, any type of surgery that you do, you have to do it. And uh, this is the intrascleral tuck. This is what gives strength to the intrascleral IOL fixation. We have to do it. Uh, about two millimeters to three millimeters tuck of the haptic into the scleral pocket is quite enough to give strength to this fixation. So once you have done this, you just remove the infusion cannula. You can see the centration of the intraocular lens on table. Do a stromal hydration, put an air bubble, remove the infusion, put a fibrin glue beneath the scleral flaps and seal it. So I think I should wind up now. Thank you so much. Thank you. Priya, I think uh, uh, that is for, uh, you are saying that uh, above 270 degree, you put it. Yes, but ma'am. Have you done it as I had asked, love, when the difference on the mixing or the, uh, the glue dial which are there, any change of position or subluxation of the lenses or haptics going down because you've been doing it for the last yes, five years? Yes. We do uh, encounter uh, these complications if probably because of any reason uh, the haptics have not been tucked or if the haptics they slip out of the pockets or uh, maybe uh, the, uh, uh, the surgeon has probably made the sclerotomy a bit more posterior so that you do not have enough haptic externalization yeah. and then what happens you know there is a, a struggle to tuck those haptics on the either side. So but by and large what I have seen is that and uh, which I keep on telling everybody is that in case if you are having a decentration on the table, it is 100% it is there and it's going to remain there. S but post-operatively, if the tucking is good, decentrations are usually not seen. Have you gone back any time to take out yes, those haptics once, and? Yes, once I, it has happened to me that my, uh, probably my uh, scleral tuck was a bit superficial, so I could see the bluish part of uh, the haptic yeah. being there. Uh, about 10 to 15 days post-op period. So what I had to do was I had to take the patient again and then I had to make again one pocket a bit more deeper than that and then I had to retuck that haptic again. Yes. Uh, Anybody in the audience some comment on the... Yeah. Quick question. Yes. Uh, that was a sensor three-piece um, IOL that you put. Yes. Do you always use that or do you have any other alternatives? No, in India we have, uh, this is one of the three-piece intraocular lenses. Previously we used to get Bosch and Lom lenses also, but they have stopped those soft port lenses. And uh, you have an Alcom three-piece intraocular lens, but somehow uh, I have no financial interest with any of the companies, let me tell you. But what I have found personally in my thing is that the uh, Alcon haptics are, uh, the uh, fixation with those doesn't come up the way it comes up with, yeah, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, with yeah. these lenses. Uh, these are better lenses. I think there's one more lens. Sensor. I think Matrix has got a longer, that has, they the came Aaron up. and the uh, Lucia Aaron, ones, yeah. they are, but they are not available in India. They are not, but they are, not available, think, but they are there. Yeah, Technus Multipiece is also there. It's yeah. a bit costly. So your preferred is the sensor yeah. three piece. I do prefer that, yes. Okay. And um, your um, port that you made uh, for the uh, vitrectomy assisted phaco emulsification, does the um, vitrectomy cutter for the anterior um, vitrectomy, that would it go through that port? What, what gauge was that? Your trocar, what gauge uh, port was that? I think that no, was that, 23. That, that, that 23. is a 23 gauge. That 23. was a 23 gauge. 23 gauge, yeah. thank you. Yes, thank you. I think we have Dr. Basti here who would be commenting on this and we had asked on him and then he'll be talking on malposition. I will, he's giving the keynote address in this session. Dr. Basti, please. Thank you, Dr. Paul and good afternoon. Uh, it, it's my pleasure to participate in a symposium where we've had some terrific presentations. Uh, I'm going to switch gears a little bit and talk about intraocular lens exchange. Uh, I have no financial interest in any aspect of this presentation. Uh, I am a consultant for Abbott Medical Optics as well as Shire. So I'm going to talk about intraocular lens exchange, which is a surgical procedure we don't do too often, but it can be therapeutic when it's necessary, especially in patients who have malpositioned intraocular lenses or uh, multifocal lenses that the patient doesn't like the vision and 
This is a surgical procedure that on the surface looks challenging, but if you take a systematic approach, uh, it can be done uh, in a very controlled manner. In the preoperative assessment of these patients, you really want to make sure you have a clear understanding of both the anterior and the posterior capsules of these patients. And let's look at that in a little more detail. Uh, these are patients who often have uh, an intact anterior capsulorexis, and you want to look carefully to see if that capsulorexis is overlapping the uh, optic of the intraocular lens all around, or if there are areas in the uh, capsulorexis where the capsulorexis is actually attached to the posterior capsule. Uh, in situations where the anterior capsulorexis covers all the edges of the optic, you also want to carefully evaluate preoperatively to see how much fibrosis there is and make a note of it. So the first step in these surgical procedures is to open the capsular bag with OVD and using a cystitome to identify uh, uh, where you can go underneath the capsular uh, edge is really the first critical step. Uh, once you've identified that spot, you go all around and inject viscoelastic to inflate the capsular bag. If you have overinflated, you, you do want to burp the viscoelastic out so you don't have an overinflated capsular bag. Like I said, injecting that OVD underneath the, uh, the capsular excess margin is the critical step, and sometimes that step can be quite challenging, especially if you have fibrosis of the anterior capsule. Uh, I really find that this cannula, uh, called the flax cannula, uh, it was originally designed for flax, but it's a very, very good cannula for IOL exchange. Uh, it has a spatulated end, uh, and uh, you can see that it's, it's actually a cannula, so you can attach it to viscoelastic, and the spatulated end really becomes useful as you try to um, separate the anterior capsule from uh, the uh, uh, capsular excess margin. So if you see here, uh, this spatulated end will uh, easily go behind that capsular uh, edge very easily. And once you do that, uh, it's kind of game over because you, you can inject viscoelastic and inflate the capsular bag as you do that. Uh, the anterior and posterior capsules will begin to separate and then you can go all the way across uh, and ensure that you have capsular separation all around. Uh, this is another example where we have much more fibrosis and you'll see the value of the flax cannula. You can see here that the uh, spatulated end easily goes underneath that fibrosed edge of the capsular uh, rexus and then begins to inflate the capsular bag. And once that inflation happens, uh, the surgical procedure becomes much more simple. Uh, in situations where there's a lot of fibrosis of the anterior capsule, the question is, how do you get that optic out of the uh, fibrosed capsular bag, especially if that diameter is quite small compared to the optic of the intraocular lens? And, and really, the choices are, you cut this optic with the lens staying in the capsular bag, so that's certainly an option. Uh, but in situations where you don't have too much fibrosis outside of the very edge of the capsular excess, you certainly can indeed uh, recut at the edge of the capsular excess and tear all around. And that's what we are doing here. Uh, there's fibrosis at the edge, certainly, but no fibrosis beyond that. So we're really doing a second capsular excess in this case so that we can uh, enlarge the capsular opening and then begin to prolapse the intraocular lens uh, out of the eye. So here we've uh, enlarged the capsular excess and then we go about getting that intraocular lens into the anterior chamber. When you have to get that lens out into the anterior chamber, which, which is the step you will do once you have an adequate opening, uh, there are some nuances to keep in mind. You really want to visualize the tip of the haptic when you're trying to dial that lens out of the bag. Uh, you can use iris hooks to achieve that goal like you can see here. And you really want to visualize the haptic completely when you're trying to dial out because the knob that you have in, in the Alcon lenses, for instance, really can have a lot of fibrosis around it. And if you're not careful and you continue to dial, you'll have a zonular dialysis. So inspecting that area as you're dialing the lens is really key. Uh, in situations where the haptic is, uh, uh, is stuck in the uh, equator, uh, the dialing will not get that haptic out easily. And in such situations, using a two-handed technique where this Sinsky hook keeps the IOL on, uh, with tug on the region of the haptic, and using a second Sinsky hook can help free the uh, knob 
at the edge of the haptic uh, in some situations. In other situations, the fibrosis is very dense, and in those situations, you'll have to uh, snip the haptic and leave that haptic in the capsular bag, and that's what we're doing here. Uh, we were successful in releasing the haptic there. So if it really won't release and it's very firmly stuck, you really have to cut it and leave the rest of the haptic in the capsular bag. The next step is to cut the intraocular lens. It's fairly straightforward if you use the right instrumentation. Uh, the Chang Packard uh, scissors are, are uh, an excellent choice, and then you get the intraocular lens out uh, through the clear corneal incision. In situations where the capsulorexis uh, is indeed attached to the edge of the uh, uh, intraocular lens and extends beyond it, so anterior and posterior capsules are actually fused to each other here, what you'll really need to do is inflate the capsular bag with viscoelastic like we did in the previous cases, uh, place the entire capsular bag in an inflated position, and then cut the uh, area of fibrosis uh, with a Grish Harbor scissor. In this instance here, we have an area where we are trying to exchange the crystal lens. The capsular excess margin is really outside of the optic of the intraocular lens. There's an area here with a lot of fibrosis, and we're using the same flax cannula that I mentioned previously, uh, where the uh, truncated edge of that flax cannula really can help uh, lice areas that are fibrosed. And you'll see that in a short while. What we're doing here is inflating the bag and then we'll use that spatulated end to lice areas that are fibrosed. Um, so we've talked about situations where we free the intraocular lens and get it out of the bag uh, where um, the posterior capsule is intact. Those are situations we've reviewed so far, and those are fairly straightforward, actually, if you take the systematic approach. But what about situations where there is a pre-existing posterior capsule break? Your, your charge in such situations is to uh, minimize any kind of extension of the posterior capsule break and be very careful with managing the vitreous appropriately. This is an example of such a case. We have a patient that I had done myself. Uh, we had a multifocal lens in the eye. Uh, what seemingly is a perfect anatomic outcome, but the patient really didn't like her intraocular lens and wanted the lens out of the eye. And we had actually created a central capsulotomy for posterior capsular opacification in this case. So we're going to go about this case, uh, starting it with the same principles that we previously talked about. We're going to identify the edge of the ca anterior capsular axis with a cystotome, uh, uh, use a Sinsky hook to make sure we've separated any adhesions between the anterior, and post anterior capsule and the optic of the intraocular lens, and then go about injecting uh, viscoelastic. <clears throat> when you inject viscoelastic in such cases, because you have a posterior capsular break, you want to be very careful about how much viscoelastic you inject. If you inject a lot of viscoelastic, it's going to go through this posterior capsular opening and further enlarge that posterior capsular break. So you want to be sparing in how much of inflation of the capsular bag you do. We've done that here, and now we're going to go about cutting the intraocular lens that's in situ. It's sitting in the bag, uh, and uh, once we've cut the intraocular lens, uh, we're going to do uh, uh, an anterior vitrectomy here, ensure there's no vitreous that's actively prolapsing out. And thereafter, we get the intraocular lens uh, out like we normally do. We're checking here for any vit vitreous, and then we'll go about uh, inserting a three-piece intraocular lens and capturing that uh, optic of the intraocular lens in the intact capsular axis that we had. So the key take-home points with intraocular lens exchange really are uh, Timing-wise, you really want to do this early, uh, but it's not mandatory that it be done early. And in situations where a patient presents to you late, you certainly can go about the, the procedure in a systematic manner and get excellent outcomes, uh, ensuring you preoperatively pre evaluate that capsular axis, look for fibrosis, look for size of that capsular axis, look for areas where the capsular axis may be adherent to the posterior capsule. Those are things you want to systematically assess. Uh, dial the intraocular lens out carefully. Make sure you're not pulling on the knob, which may be fibrosed in the equator, and then carefully cut the intraocular lens before you get it out of the eye. Uh, a, a, a very uh, sound principle is to have a backup lens uh, and uh, also an intraocular lens uh, that is an anterior chamber lens in situations where the capsule really tears. 
Uh, the other situation that I want to quickly talk about are situations where the entire capsular bag with the intraocular lens in it has subluxed. And uh, those are situations where uh, you start by creating a Hoffman pocket. Um, so we are doing that uh, uh, perpendicularly, uh, two Hoffman pockets created with uh, a crescent blade. Uh, and once the Hoffman pockets have been created, there's vitreous here, so we're going to do a shallow anterior vitrectomy. Uh, and then we're going to pass a 27-gauge uh, needle. Uh, the needle has to engage the capsular bag posterior to the haptic. Uh, you then uh, get one uh, double-armed suture anterior and one double-armed suture posterior to the haptic so that the two suture ends of the double-armed suture can then... Um, uh, be tied uh, in the Hoffman pocket. So that's really the principle that we're going to follow in such cases. Here we've, we've passed both the sutures and we're going to tie the, the uh, uh, knot in the Hoffman pocket and get the intraocular lens well centered. Now this is passed very fast and I want to take a moment to uh, show you this other case where we're going to uh, carefully spell out what we're doing. This is clearly a patient with very significant uh, IOL luxation, the lens is in the bag with significant fibrosis. So we uh, create two Hoffman pockets, we've talked about that. Uh, it's a fairly straightforward uh, step to do. The Hoffman pocket needs to be about uh, half scleral thickness deep, not deeper than that, and about three millimeters wide. And you want to mark the edges of that Hoffman pocket. Uh, once you've created two Hoffman pockets, you want to take care to make sure they are 180 degrees apart. If they are not, you're going to have tilt of the intraocular lens or decentration. You place iris hooks to visualize the area where your needles will pass and uh, uh, pass the two uh, sutures of a double armed suture. Uh, uh, one of those will go posterior to the haptic and the second one will go anterior to the haptic of the intraocular lens. So essentially those are the steps that you do in these cases where the intraocular lens is in the capsular bag but the whole capsular bag is prolapsed. Uh, when you're passing those sutures, you want to make sure that you're using some counter pressure. If you don't, you can uh, tear the zonules that are existing in such a case. Once you've passed the two sutures, you, you pull them out of the Hoffman's pocket and then tie the uh, two suture ends to each other so that the suture is buried in the Hoffman pocket. So uh, these are the principles we use in patients who have the entire intraocular lens that's subluxed out. Uh, you can in, uh, achieve good fixation of the intraocular lens using this technique. There are clearly alternatives like uh, what Dr. Narang uh, mentioned where you get the whole capsular bag out and use a different intraocular lens and have its cleadal fixated. But those are all options that we should have as surgeons. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Basti, for illuminating us with so beautiful videos and the principles how to fixate the lenses. Anybody in the audience would like to ask Dr. Basti any Verification, we still have five minutes or we can call off the session as the next session presenters are already here. I can take it back up. Thank you. Thank you for this wonderful session. And thanks all my co-instructors and the key note addressee for making this session such a